All right. So what we want to do is we want to continue to talk about the large catechism and kind of remember what we were talking about last time with the conscience. We're still doing an overview of the conscience and the large catechism. And last week we were talking about the Ten Commandments, First Commandment, and the Second Commandment in particular, that whole first table or tablet of the law, how you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And if you remember, the way that Luther is working with the conscience in that first commandment is that any kind of a system of self-righteousness, any kind of uh, 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 worship without God's word, that is a matter of the conscience because the conscience connects you with the creator. And so any kind of a system where you are trying to make God merciful with some kind of man-made method, okay, that is having another God. That's having another image or imagining what you think God is like and what is going to placate God's wrath and what's going to make him merciful. And as we said last time, you can't make God merciful. God is merciful. There's nothing you can do that would win or earn or merit God's favor. And so when Luther looks at that first commandment in the conscience in particular, he's going to go directly to monasticism. All of this monkery business where you're trying to make God merciful by these man-made efforts. Okay, That's a, a first commandment issue. And then Luther goes to the second commandment. Uh, first commandment, you shall have no other gods. The second commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. And now here's where he's talking about it's a spiritual matter when you have teachers trying to teach this conscience. And the issue here, of course, is a false teacher is misusing God's name taking upon the name of God as if it were God's doctrine, God's word, and what God says. And so a false prophet is leading you astray from God and his word, from God's revealed will where we have the knowledge of salvation. And so the, the false prophet misusing God's name is, is toying with your conscience, okay? uh, trying to think that maybe either you're right in your own sight, kind of confirming you in this, uh, this conscience that says I'm secure in my sin, or trying to enslave you to this conscience that just falls into utter despair. I mean, the two extremes. And so again, that's why in the Lutheran faith, we want to make sure we have a proper distinction between the law and the gospel. We want to properly proclaim the law, which reveals God's wrath because of sin, our sin provokes God to anger and wrath. And then the gospel that, of course, shows us our Savior, who comes to save us from our own sin. And so when you have the law, the law is going to once again sink your conscience back with God's will, with God's word, with God's law, because God alone is the judge of what is right and wrong. Since we live in this fallen state, this corrupted nature, we have this idea that we can make God in our own image and likeness, and the things that we like to do happens to be the things that God likes to do. Okay? We have these, this idea of a domesticated deity. That's what idolatry is. It's a, a false understanding of who God is. It is the imagination of the sinful heart, uh, thinking that if you do these things, this is how you win or earn favor with God. Okay? And so when you have the law, it once again sets your conscience back to the Creator, that He alone is the judge of what is right and wrong. As soon as that happens, though, now you've been brought before the judgment seat of God, and you realize that you are a sinner, and you stand before the holy, righteous judge, and you cannot stand before God in your own righteousness. You can't do it. And so you, you have that guilt that takes over the conscience. You become terrified. But making this distinction, then, is you give the gospel so that you can comfort that terrified conscience. So that in the gospel, you can hear the message of Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. That that's the image of God that you want to see, the personal work of Christ. He's the one who is the king of the conscience. He's the one who will comfort you and console you. That your sin is no longer your sin. It becomes his sin. So he owns your sin. And if Jesus owns your sin, it's not your sin. So the one who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. So this is the whole uh, crucifixion of Christ, taking upon our trespasses. And then it's the resurrection of Christ who is raised for our righteousness. He stands as a high priest to justify us before God with a righteousness that is not ours. It is a gift. It is given to us as a gift, and we receive this by faith. 
And so in that whole first tablet, the first table, this is our understanding of how we are to be right with God in our conscience. When you move to the second table or second tablet, now we're talking about loving others, how we are to be right with others here. So you go right with God vertically and then right with neighbor horizontally. And immediately when you have the second table or second tablet, you go to the fourth commandment. So this is where Luther is going to start with the fourth commandment and the conscience with the, the commandment you are to honor your father and your mother so that you know from God's word what his will is. You don't have to make it up. You don't have to guess. Your conscience does not have to be enslaved with, am I doing something that is pleasing to God? Okay. And this is the bottom line problem with monasticism, is it's a man-made method of trying to make God merciful. And so you're trying to follow these orders, you're trying to follow this system that's man-made. Okay. Whether or not God is happy with this, we don't know. God did not say. This is a man-made system of what you're trying to think that is making God happy. And so Luther immediately will talk about the conscience in monasticism again with the fourth commandment. Because in the fourth commandment, understand that in monasticism, you are taking a vow of obedience. And so that vow of obedience is this idea that in the Middle Ages, you were only spiritual. You only have a spiritual calling if you become a monk or a nun. And then, of course, if you're a man, you go on to become a priest. And if you work your way up the system, you become a bishop or archbishop or a pope, for that matter. But, but it's a whole system of climbing the ladder. It's like the corporate ladder. I mean, but it's the ecclesiastical ladder. And so in this, this fourth commandment, you have a proper understanding of what God's will is for us in our lives, what actually makes us spiritual. So as Christians, as the baptized, we are spiritual people. We've been united into the death and resurrection of Christ. We have a new identity. We are in Christ. We, have, we are a new creation. Therefore, there's no condemnation. And now we be, can begin to walk in newness of life. And we begin to pattern our life after his will. Of course, we always, we stumble, we fall, we fail. We need the forgiveness of sins constantly. We never perfectly do this in this life. But you understand that God has instituted uh, marriage, which is a good thing. God has instituted this whole understanding of in marriage, the union between a man and a woman produces life. Okay, this is how God brings life through the instrumental means of a man and a woman. He Procreate. This is the procreation where we continue to have life. And so you go from the, the understanding with parents that you have a vow of obedience. You don't need to leave your parents behind and go to a real Christian community. As a Christian with parents, you already have a Christian community with Christian parents. So this is why in the catechism, Luther is saying this is the way that the head of the household is to teach his household the Christian faith. The basics of the Christian faith and you start with the Ten Commandments. So you don't need to leave the Christian home to be spiritual or to find a Christian community. That Christian community has already begun in the home with your closest neighbor in proximity, your own mother and your father. So Luther is saying here that you don't need to go follow this uh, vow of obedience. You already have this understanding that you are to honor and obey your father and mother. You already have that. You already have the Christian family. You have the Christian community in the home. Any uh, thoughts or uh, questions on it? I just think that's good what you said about, you know, his will for our life. And also, you know, if you see like in the last 50 or 60 years, you can see how the degradation of our society has led to, um, you know, people kicking their kids out immediately, which I think is contrary to what God's design is. Like for our kids example, uh, you know, we're not trying to push them out of the home. We want them to stay in the home because their their Christian family is here mm -hmm. until they find a godly husband to go marry off to. Whereas today we're we're pushing you know all in society, especially in America, they're pushing the kids out and into the world to go experience it. And there's nothing but peril out there, you know, for them to go. But if they would understand the scripture like you talked about, then they real you realize that you know God designed for them to be in that Christian family in that household to be raised that way. So that they would be protected and they would have that upbringing, yep. which we're getting away from, mm -hmm. you know, in our society because 
you know, sin is pushing those people away, which mm -hmm. is unfortunate. And, and so it plays with the conscience, though. So then you don't know if what you're doing is the right thing or not. You might think it's the right thing. You might think it's the wrong thing. But if you have God's clear word, then you know for certain and sure what God's will is and how God has established this, how God has put together this institution of marriage, a husband, one man, uh, a wife, one woman to be joined together in union so that they would have children, so they'd be procreating. And then so that we can then see the image, of course, of Christ in his church. The Christ is the bridegroom who gives up his life for the church. And then when he gives up his life, he washes and cleanses his church and makes her holy, the bride, the holy bride. So we see that image there. Right. Yeah. And, and talking about the conscience and, you know, what you said about our will for our life. I mean, being a former Baptist, I can tell you that all those people, and including myself, at some point, were always seeking what is God's will for my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to pray to see if God wants me to have this blue car or this red car, mm -hmm. you know, and everything was trying to seek God's will for our life in the everyday decisions of this life instead of, you know, just trusting that he's already provided that for us. We follow his Ten Commandments mm -hmm. and he's given us free will for the things on this earth, mm -hmm. you know. And so the conscience was always conflicted because we had to try to discern that, mm -hmm. which is that's not what we're supposed to do. No, I mean, this is a great point because this is the idea of having a good conscience. So that, that conscience becomes evil when it's distorted. It, it, it takes in this misinformation that is now deforming the conscience and aligning and sinking the conscience with the ways of the world. And it becomes conflicted. It, it, be, it doesn't know what's right and wrong. And then it gets confused on what's right and wrong. But as a Christian, as one who's been baptized, who has the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the promise uh, of Christ who's working in our life, newness of life, then he, he gives to us the, the Ten Commandments as God's will. And we begin to understand with a good conscience, this is the way we ought to go. So we don't have to guess. We don't have to make stuff up or see what's, you know, is it's God's will that I take the, the blue car or the red car. We have a good conscience and we're free. Okay, we're free to that. I mean, it doesn't matter. Do, do I want pizza or a hamburger for, for supper? I mean, you, you have that freedom here on this, this horizontal plane. And so that good conscience, it frees you up to just live, to, to live with a good conscience before God, and now you can be of service to your neighbor. Yeah, I just had a question about what Luther means by conscience, because I'm reading a biography about him, and he talks about when he was at the Diet of Arms, and he talks about his conscience. Mm -hmm. And the author tries to explain that conscience has a different, had a different meaning then than it does now. And it was, you know, more of relating to, you know, knowledge or to knowing something. So I'm just curious um, how to interpret the conscience in the yeah. large catechism as Luther uses it. No, that, that's good. So again, Luther, the Diet of Worms, Worms, I mean, as we say, Worms, right? Uh, but the Diet of Worms is, uh, he stands up and says, I will not recant, you know, here I stand, I can do no other. Why? Because my conscience is captive to the word of God. So it's the word of God that's informing his conscience. It's not the words of men. It's not the way of the world so that you're confused. I mean, either you, your conscience may be completely seared and numb to what's truly right and wrong, but you might be secure in your own sin and think everything's good. Uh, but Luther is saying, my conscience is captive to the word of God. So he's standing with the word of God. And th this understanding of a conscience has to do with understanding, okay? I mean, to understand conscience, that's understanding, right? It's, it's, a, it's a perception, it's a seeing. So when we talk about in humanity, all humanity has a shared seeing of things. We have a shared knowledge of things. And each one of us has that conscience that connects us back to the Creator, okay? We are His creatures, He gives it as a gift. And so we have a shared knowledge. Originally, when we are uh, conceived in the womb, we're born, uh, we then have this conscience that's synced with natural law. So we have a shared seeing of what is right and wrong with natural law. And so that's why even the unbelievers, the pagan world, can still have a basic understanding that uh, it's not a good thing to murder. <laughs> it's, a, it's not a good thing to uh, commit adultery and steal somebody's wife. It's not a good thing to steal somebody's property. I mean, all these things, the, even the pagan understands this because that's the, the natural law that's written on the heart. So that conscience has that shared seeing, that shared knowing. However, because we live in this fallen world, in this corrupted creation, the whole culture that is corrupted continues to try to cultivate the conscience. So we have a different way of perceiving things, a different way of knowing things. And so that's why in the culture, the culture will uh, speak really loud 
to drown out the conscience. Really loud trying to drown out the conscience because your conscience is saying, hey, this is a sin. But the culture is saying, it's not sin, it's okay. It's okay because we're all doing it. So now the, the culture is trying to cultivate your conscience so that you see things the same way. You know things the same way. I mean, this is that etymology of what conscience is. But the conscience is not to connect you to the corrupted creation. The conscience is to connect you back to the creator. Now, originally we have that natural law and we can keep going back to that natural law. However, when you get uh, uh, just overwhelmed with the, the corrupted culture, your conscience be, it becomes conformed to the culture. And so this is why we need God's word to once again sink us back with God. So instead of looking to creation that's fallen, we look back to the creator and then we see and we know what God wants us to see and know. And so throughout the scriptures, you are seeing the vision. Okay, what the prophets have is they have a vision, a vision that comes from God. It's a shared seeing. So that now you see what the prophet sees. Now you know what the prophet knows. But that's called a revealed knowledge. It, when we walk around in creation, we have this, this natural knowledge of things. And the natural knowledge is just how we observe. We just experience things in this life. And the problem is the culture is always trying to tell us, be part of fallen creation. Cling to fallen creation. It's always trying to cultivate the conscience. But God's word is always trying to, once again, reset the conscience so that we see things properly. That God is the one who is the judge. He alone is the one who decides what is right and wrong. And then when we are brought before the judgment seat of God, then we understand that in our own sin, we, we, we stand condemned in our own sin. But then it's that, that revealed knowledge of salvation with Jesus then brings true comfort to the conscience. That Jesus is the one who takes away the sin. So that we have that shared seeing of that vision of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So would a good definition of conscience then be our knowledge of good and evil then? our understanding of the knowledge of good and evil? Yeah, it, it, it has to do with the knowledge. The conscience also has to do with kind of measuring that. So there's the measuring. So you, in your own conscience, you are measuring if you're doing the right thing or not. But your conscience only can measure what you're thinking, can only measure what you're saying, can only measure what you're doing. But any kind of a, a tool or an instrument that measures things, I mean, it can get off balance. And so it can give you the wrong measurement. So you got to tune it back. He needs to be back, uh, fine-tuned back to with God's word. Calibrated. Calibrated. Yeah, that's the word. Calibrated. Exactly. <laughs> it needs to be calibrated with God's word. Okay. I mean, so when you think of the conscience, again, it has to do with the. It's it's measuring. It's measuring these things, but also that conscience it connects you to the Creator. So it it's something that's going to connect the creature. We're all creatures to the Creator. I mean, does that make sense? Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and we're going to begin again uh, with the fourth commandment. So if you open up in your uh, large catechism, and we're using the public domain version, um, if you look at the large catechism in the fourth commandment, drop down to paragraph 121. And so, again, take note that we, we began in the first commandment talking about monasticism, and Luther, of course, will bring back up monasticism again with the fourth commandment because it's tied to that vow of obedience, right? So in paragraph number 121, Luther says this, Therefore, I would be very glad, I say it again, if men would open their eyes and ears and take this to heart, lest sometime we may again be led astray from the pure word of God, to the lying vanities of the devil. Then too, all would be well, for parents would have more joy, love, friendship, and concord in their houses. Thus the children could captivate their parents' hearts. Okay. So again, look at what Luther's doing here, is he's going back to the household as a community of believers. You don't need to go off to the monastery to find a spiritual community. In the Christian home, now the assumption here, of course, is the Christian home. In the Christian home, you are learning the Ten Commandments, you're learning the Word of God and what God's will is. And so you're going back, to the, this is what would make us glad if we could go back to this. So paragraph number 122 goes on and says, On the other hand, when they are obstinate and will not do what they ought until a rod is laid upon their back, they anger both God and their parents. 
whereby they deprive themselves of this treasure and joy of conscience. So notice the, he's using this, this language of a joy of the conscience. It's a, a joyful conscience here. This conscience itself is, is joyful when it's in sync with God's will, not with man-made methods of trying to make God merciful, not monasticism, not this monkery. But if you go back to the Christian home and uh, you have this understanding that we are to honor our father and mother in the fourth commandment, that this is spiritual because it's what God himself has put into place. God's word makes things holy. And so it's not the holy orders of monasticism because the Pope says so. It's God's word that makes things holy. God's the one who establishes this union of a man and a woman in marriage where you have the children. And so this is where the conscience would be filled with joy. And so you deprive yourselves of this because you're enslaved with this understanding of a monastic uh, way of life, that that's the only spiritual way of life, the only way of real Christian community. Uh, but when Christians, uh, of, of course, the, the children, they, uh, uh, they're disobedient to their parents, of course, now we're in this, this conflicted problem because now the conscience is going to tell you that you are uh, guilty, right? But you're depriving themselves of the treasure and the joy of the conscience and lay up for themselves only misfortune, mis uh, okay? Uh, and, and so this is this idea of if you're disobeying parents, uh, you're depriving yourself of this joyful conscience, a good conscience, you're stuck in this idea that uh, you are going to override your conscience. So as kids, when we were young, when we were really young, and your parents said, do this, don't do that. As young, young children, we took this to heart, and we knew when we were doing right or wrong in our parents' sight, right? We knew that. And all you had to do was just, uh, the, uh, your mom or your dad, if they walk into the room and you're doing something wrong, all your mother or your father has to do is just say your name. And if you're doing something wrong, you jump. <laughs> you know you did it wrong. Um, or uh, you, you might have a child where all you have to do is just say the child's name, and the child knows he did something wrong, and he starts crying because he already knows what he did was wrong, and he already knows it displeases his father or his mother. Okay? But you're depriving yourself of that joyful conscience when you know that you are in sync and in line with God's will uh, in, in your conscience there.